Please welcome to the stage, Professor Martin Doyle, Director of the Water Policy Program at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, if you're like me, you grabbed a glass of water at some point during the day, and uh, you probably had that glass of water with you. Might have grabbed a, a bottle of water as well, but if you grabbed some water out of a water fountain or if you were in a hotel here and you started to, to drink out of that, chances are you didn't think very much about that water, where that water came from, uh, whether or not you should actually drink that water. Chances are you didn't think about whether or not you'd get sick from drinking that water. Um, and that's just something that we've fallen in the habit of uh, here in Oregon as well as in the United States. We don't think a whole lot about our water. When we do think about our water, we usually think about it in a very negative sense. Uh, we talk about water wars, water as a way of dividing us between us and them. Uh, we think about how dysfunctional uh, the water management system that we actually has it, have is. Well, in a lot of ways, this is actually true. So if we think about uh, an organism moving through water, salmon, um, let's just follow a single salmon as it works its way up from the Pacific Ocean up through the Columbia River and gets up in, uh, to a spawning bed. So it starts in the Pacific Ocean, and it's under the National Marine Fisheries Service, which is a part of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is part of the Department of Commerce. It goes into the Columbia River, which is a navigable waterway, and it gets up to the Bonneville Dam, which is under the Corps of Engineers, which is under the Department of Defense. But the energy from the Bonneville Dam is marketed by BPA, which is part of the Department of Army. Uh, part of the Department of Energy. It gets around that dam through a fish ladder, uh, start, keeps swimming on up that river, goes past a stream gauge, which is monitoring flow, and that's funded by the U.S. Geological Survey, which is part of the Department of Interior. It also goes by a weather station, which is part of the National Weather Service, which is, again, under the Department of Commerce. It takes a right turn, uh, and it goes on up a tributary, and it goes through a national forest, which is a part of the Department of Agriculture, good, uh, and it keeps working its way up, maybe it works past a little section of a floodplain that's been mapped out by FEMA, which is under the Department of Homeland Security, and then it keeps going up to BLM land, which is under the Department of Interior. It spawns, it dies, a bear grabs its carcass and pulls it up onto the land, which is in the sovereign state of Oregon. So the regulatory pathway of this salmon shows just how many pieces actually go into managing our water and how dysfunctional we might actually view that. But the important thing is the salmon has ended its, its long-term uh, uh, voyage there, and it's ended its life on rural land. So it's, it's there on rural land, and that's actually where a lot of our water actually starts. So if you drink water here in Oregon, in fact, if you drink water uh, in most of the United States, you're drinking water that had its start of its life as a droplet chances are that that droplet fell on rural land. And so rural land is really the birthplace of either recharge of our aquifers or actually runoff that feeds a lot of the streams and rivers that we actually have. And that's because the bulk of the landscape in Oregon is rural, whether it's uh, rangeland, uh, farmland, whether it's vineyards, uh, whether it's just ranches. Um, a lot of the landscape is rural, and so a lot of the water that we generate, that, that we end up drinking here in, in urban areas, um, has its life starting as rural landscapes. <clears throat> now, what this means is that rural and urban areas are actually connected through water. And instead of dividing them, I wonder if water actually unites us. Um, at Duke University, we started a project that we called the Rural Attitudes Project. We went out and surveyed 1,600 people around the United States. 50% of those people were from rural areas, and 50% of them were from urban or suburban areas. And we asked them a series of questions. And some of the questions were uh, about the environment and the outdoors. And what we found about, uh, about this actually really surprised us. <clears throat> so just the, just the rural voters that we uh, surveyed, if you ask them what, is the, what are the top two priorities that they have for the future, uh, for going forward of the long term, the number one answer tends to be water. So whether they're Republicans, independents, or Democrats, they tend to rate water as the number one concern going forward. Now, political party actually uh, seems to shape whether they consider farmland or climate change to be one of the top two as well. But actually, the concern over water unites rural and urban areas. Uh, or it actually unites political parties. Um, in fact, it also unites rural and urban areas. So clean water tops the list when we roll all the people back together, regardless of political affiliation, look at them for urban versus rural. Again, farmlands and climate change show up as number two, but the number one concern of these two different groups of people is actually clean water. So water unites us. It doesn't really divide us as much as we think it does. 
Now, Oregon has started to look at this over a series of strategy documents and vision plans over the past decade or so, um, and they've looked at, the, at this broad landscape of urban and rural concerns, and there are a lot of things that start to come up. But three of them that are fairly consistent for the future of Oregon's water are the sustainability of water resources, just raw water, especially aquifers. They're also concerned about the future of water quality, the pollutants that are in our water, including things like nitrogen and phosphorus or fertilizers or nutrients. And then the third one is just information about our water. What data do we actually have about the water that we're drinking every day? And so Oregon is a, a hotbed for a lot of innovation around water. There are companies in Eastern Oregon that are, uh, that are world leaders in precision irrigation, um, of being able to deliver just enough water to each plant uh, for that plant to grow, and so not wasting any water. There's also innovators here in Portland uh, that are taking advantage of creating new types of market mechanisms so that we can do water quality trading, use market-like mechanisms to actually lead to new types of water uh, quality management. But in reality, uh, Oregon is part of 50 states, and uh, Louis Brandeis told us that states are the laboratories of democracy, and I'd encourage you to start looking at what other states are doing. And specifically, there's three states that have been doing some very interesting things relevant to Oregon, California, Iowa, and New Mexico. Now, nobody that I, that I found in the United States likes to hear about lessons from California. Uh, but in this case, it said there's actually some good things that are coming out of California for water management because over the past decade, they've suffered a series of droughts that have been absolutely staggering. In 2014, they had a statewide drought. And what this drought did was it reduced surface flows, so streams and river flows, so much that groundwater pumping was used as essentially the battery in the system. So groundwater started to replace a lot of that water loss. Two years later, uh, in 2016, a similar sized drought came in, especially in the southern part of the state. And because of the severity of these droughts, what California did was start to do a series of different policy actions to address uh, water challenges in their state. They didn't do one single big thing. They did a series of incremental bite-sized types of policy approaches. And the one that was really interesting to me was SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which was passed in 2014. The thing that was really innovative about it was they didn't come up with a single monolithic approach for the entire state. Instead, what they said was there are 127 priority aquifers that were being depleted in California, and each one of those 127 aquifers was going to have a GSA, a Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and they were going to be in charge of their own plan for coming up with a 20-year sustainability plan. That is, what they did was say, we're gonna let the locals lead on this. We, we're gonna recognize that every part of the state is different, and we think that local groups can actually come up with not just innovative solutions, but durable solutions. And so letting locals lead was something that California did in a very proactive way. In the West, you have water wars. In the Midwest, we've started to see the rise of water quality wars. Um, especially on the Raccoon River in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Raccoon River goes through rural landscape, goes through Des Moines, and in 2015, the water works in Des Moines, so basically the urban residents, sued drainage districts up in the rural area for water quality degradation on the Raccoon River. So there's a lawsuit about water quality. So this is a continuation, an us versus them type of a battle between rural and urban areas. You're not that unique in uh, Oregon in this matter. But what Iowa did, the lawsuit failed, but Iowa was very proactive about how can we start to not just have conversations about uh, linking these two communities together, how can we actually start binding these two different communities together? And one thing that they did was they used the State Revolving Fund, which is a subsidized loan program from the state. Um, and they started to use that in a very innovative way. And one thing that they did with it was they made loans out to uh, urban areas, especially to wastewater treatment plants or publicly owned treatment works, and they gave them a subsidized loan under the condition that some of the financial savings from that loan would be used to do projects for water quality improvement in rural areas. So there was economic benefits to the urban areas, there were economic benefits to the rural areas. Binding those two together financially actually gave both groups an incentive to work together. A really innovative way to start thinking about moving past an us versus them rhetoric. The last one, as I think about this water is, uh, and as you're drinking water from a bottle or even or from the tap, I don't actually know what's in this water. So yesterday as I was coming out to Oregon from North Carolina, um, I uh, checked the traffic on the roads, uh, I got to the airport, I actually checked the traffic in Beijing, uh, it was very bad yesterday. Um, I checked the air traffic for Portland as well as Seattle, and I also just on a whim checked the air traffic in Mumbai and Dublin, um, because I could do all of those things. I got to my hotel last night and I checked the water quality for the, where the address was uh, for the hotel that I was staying, and what do you think I found? 
Have you ever tried to Google the water quality that you're actually drinking? Um, chances are you can find 15,000 cat videos and zero information about the water that you're drinking or the water that you're bathing in. This was a problem that New Mexico recognized. They realized that they were collecting an enormous amount of water quality and water quantity data, that their state agencies, irrigation districts, uh, publicly owned treatment works were all collecting data by regulatory requirements. Those data were being reported and kept in completely different ways. One group was keeping it in spreadsheets and emailing spreadsheets around. The other group was doing it with PDFs and maybe saving and sending those uh, PDFs around. Some groups, not surprisingly, were using handwritten forms and putting them into physical file cabinets. We basically were trying to manage water in the 21st century using 20th century approaches and technologies. So New Mexico joined a group that was a broader group around the United States that's trying to develop something called the Internet of Water. And the idea is that if you're collecting water data, that we're going to do that in a 21st century way. And New Mexico went a step further uh, beyond what other states were doing. They actually passed a law, a Water Data Transparency Act, that a couple other states have done as well. And their state agencies now, over the past six months, have actually been starting to move those data into standardized forms, into forms that are open, they're transferable, they're transparent, they're interoperable. And that's starting to build the skeleton of an internet of water for the state of New Mexico. So that in two or three years, if you were to go to New Mexico, you could actually show up at a hotel or at a uh, conference center and you could Google your address and the water quality and you would actually know how much water is there, where's that water coming from, and is that water actually safe to drink. So as we think about Oregon's water going forward, think about ways that you can actually leverage local communities. How can you put them in charge of the water uh, problems or the water solutions that you have? What are ways that you can actually bind together uh, rural communities and urban communities so that they're co-developing solutions that benefit both of them? And should you or should you not have an internet of water? What should we actually know about the, water, the quality of the water and the quantity of the water that we depend on every day? As you think about the future of Oregon, you've talked a lot about the, the jobs of the future, the economy of the future, um, the education of the future as well. And I think it's equally as important to make sure that you're going to have the water availability, affordability, uh, and quality that will actually drive that future forward. Thank you.